for the DMI Economic Development Committee. It's good to see you all. So many faces. Hi, Darren. Hi, Julie. Hi, Pam. Hi, Jenny. So many people here. We're excited. We've got a great presentation. Hi, Troy. Hi, Tara. Hi, John. This is fun. Uh, great presentation today. Sorry, I'm coming from a hotel uh, at a conference, the International Downtown Association this week. We're learning a lot about downtowns, our fellow members. Lots of good conversations with Milwaukee and Raleigh and Boulder and lots of great cities. So fun things happening here. Susan knows all about it, was a frequent attendee at IDA. She loves IDA and I have a big shout out to Susan for helping me understand how, the importance of the International Downtown Association. Uh, all right, so we're gonna get in and start as we always do with a note from our esteemed chair, Andrea Morrison. Good morning, Ann. How are you, my friend? Good morning. It's great to see everybody. And I want to say it was great to see so many of you downtown last night at the Chamber of Commerce dinner live and in person. Um, I'm glad that could hopefully safely happen. And it was nice to see everybody in person. Um, I'm really excited about today. I think at the last DMI economic development meeting, there was a lot of side chatter from um, Pam's conversation and interest in hearing about what's going on on Regent Street. And um, this is a really exciting topic that has been going on, I think, behind the scenes. Many folks might not know the role that Jason has played in it historically, and Pam and others. And I think we're just poised to hear a lot more about the Regent Street Corridor. So we appreciate this preview. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to Jason, who's going to update on some of the other economic development work of DMI and go into this presentation about the Regent revitalization work that's ongoing. Thank you, Jason. Fantastic. Thank you, Anne. Um, there's lots happening uh, here in the DMI world of economic development. I want to say a huge thank you to so many of you that attended a couple of events last week uh, that were really quite important. Uh, first on Monday, I know uh, uh, several people were there for the president of executive director, excuse me, of the Congress for New Urbanism, CNU, Rick Cole came to town. Uh, he was with the Wisconsin chapter. They went to Milwaukee, but they also took a tour of downtown Madison on Monday. It was a very wet tour of the Capitol East District. It rained the entire time, uh, but it was a fantastic tour of the buildings, the built environment, Bree Stevens, all the things that are happening there. So thank you for attending that event. Then also a huge, huge shout out to, to Ann Morrison and the team at ULI for hosting um, a, co a event, event that we co-hosted with the National Organization for Minority Architects, NOMA, Wisco NOMA, the uh, new Wisconsin version with Rafiq Assad and the team. Uh, it was a great Great event on top of the U.S. Bank building on the fourth floor. Beautiful space, beautiful event. A, t a ton of you all were there. So thank you. We really do appreciate you being there. I know, Patrick, several of you, I, I saw you there. Uh, so really appreciate appreciate uh, that work. We're going to see more from our friends at NOMA. We were um, excited to partner with them on this event and all the great work that they are doing uh, throughout the community. Uh, only other last announcement for DMI is next week, we do have a hybrid uh, event on the 28th, where we will be live at 10 a.m., the 28th on 10 a.m., so new time uh, for our virtual What's Up Downtown breakfast. I guess we'll call it a virtual or a hybrid What's Up Downtown late breakfast. But we haven't come up with a new name yet for the 10 a.m. Uh, but for this one, we're moving it to 10 a.m. Uh, come join us live at the Edgewater, although we do have requirements for masking and uh, vaccinations and all the rest. So please do see our website there and register there so you see all that information. And then we'll also be on Zoom for an important conversation, speaking of Regent Street, on Lexi, from Lexi London, the executive director of the Bayview Foundation. If you haven't been to the corner of Regent uh, and West Washington, they are shovels in the ground already and, and doing an amazing project. This is really a cool story. Uh, and there's a little slight DMI twist to the story, uh, but I won't, I won't uh, tell you what it is. I'll let Lexi tell that story. So please do join us. Really important work uh, happening on Regent Street. Please do. Uh, no, I don't think that the 10 a.m. time is going to be permanent, um, Susan. So thank you for the question. Uh, we'll probably go back to 8 a.m. But for this one, it worked out for 10 a.m. Uh, for us. So please do join us next week, a week from today at the uh, Edgewater Hotel or on Zoom. We've got the amazing, talented Adeline Plummer, who somehow can figure out how both things work. And all I have to do is hold two mics at once. So she makes it very easy on us. So thank you to the staff. All right, we are going to get into a discussion about Regent Street. And I should give a nod to Jenny Jeffers. Jenny, you ask a question. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I'm presenting the next month. So thank you, Jenny, for your question last month to Pam about Regent Street. Um, there's been a lot of work on Regent Street uh, that I took part of as a member of the Monroe Street Merchants Association at my time at Hotel Ren. Pam Christensen has been a huge part of this project, as has Gary Brown, um, uh, Rob Gottschalk, and, and, and so many people in that area, Roger Charles, 
Charlie and you name the list goes on uh, of work that's happened on Regent Street. So we wanted to update Steve Brown. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dan Seeley, Margaret Watson. Uh, getting good notes in the chat today. I appreciate that. Um, really interesting things that are happening on Regent Street. So we're going to talk today about what's called the Regent Street Revitalization Project. We'll go over what, what's happened so far with the project, where they hope to move forward, and what they're working on now. Uh, and an opportunity analysis was put together uh, by the group, uh, by Vandewall and Associates, about how we can move forward. And then some updates on some projects, so the aforementioned um, Reach, uh, excuse me, Bayview Foundation project on Regent Street, uh, and lots of things that are happening. And then we'll open it up for discussion as to how we're going to move forward, because we certainly would like y'all to participate in this work. So the project, the Regent Street Revitalization Project started, what, Pam, six years ago or so? Uh, it was a group of stakeholders led by uh, UW, uh, the hospitals, SSM, Meritor, MG&E, uh, Dan Lee and the team at uh, First Weber and also the Realtors Association, uh, really looking to um, figure out what's happening around the hospitals and around the university in the Greenbush, Vilas, and on Regent Street uh, areas. The first project that they ran uh, was a small cap TIF fund through the city. Matt Walker was a huge part of this process. And the small cap TIF fund um, was trying to turn in some of the rental housing that maybe had seen a better day into either... Um, Owner, well, owner occupied, but either single family uh, duplexes or triplexes in the area. And that was very successful. They ran through the money quite quickly. Pam, I believe it was about 10 to a dozen projects that turned over at that time, if I remember correctly. Uh, very successful project, um, but ran out of money and that project ended. And the group said, well, what are we going to do next? We were led by former mayor Dave Cheslevich, um, who was working with MGE and the hospitals and all the rest to put this together. And the group decided they wanted to pivot towards Regent Street itself and look at what can happen with this corridor, um, which is a very important corridor on the western side of the city. Um, and so they wanted to look at what was actually around for Regent Street at that time. And in 2008, a very well thought out um, and great community outreach work happened on the Regent Street neighborhood plan that ran through the city. So all there's, you know, Julia Carr and all, and all the team uh, put this work together. Chuck Erickson from the county put the Regent Street plan together. But as you all know, this is no offense to anyone. I know Bill Furling's on this call, but sometimes these plans get created and they maybe get put on a, on a back shelf and get a little dusty. The idea was to implement this project and to make it happen. And so the group moved forward with many of the property owners, the neighborhood associations, Greenbush, Canna, uh, Violas, um, the hospitals, all these different groups to say, let's implement the Regent Street plan. Uh, and so this was the second iteration of that work. But before we begin, we had the good fortune uh, of having some benefactors, particularly MG&E and, and C. Brown and many others, that helped us with putting together an opportunity analysis of what can happen on this street. So I'm going to go over the opportunity analysis. Admittedly, I was a participant in this, but did not put this together. This is all Rob Gottschalk, Pam Christensen, and the team. So uh, I'm certainly do not think I'm taking any credit for a presentation I had nothing to do with. Um, but it is, it is really excellent work, and it shows you what can happen on this street when you really start looking at the street. Uh, Hold, please. I have too many things open at once. Surprise, surprise. We're patient. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right. Can you all see that? Yes. Something. And there we go. There we go. Okay. Delayed. Sorry. A delay from Tampa, Florida uh, here. And yes, it is 89 and sunny today. Uh, very hot. Uh, anyway, not the all. Why, why I just said that, I have no idea. Take that back. Take that <laughs> Rub back. it in. All right. <laughs> so here we are exploring the opportunities from right here. We have a picture of that Regent Street South Campus plan, which we talked about was uh, released in 2008. What can happen with this street? It's a, such an important and vital um, throughway, but also neighborhoods. These are, you know, some of the most important uh, neighborhoods on the near west side. It really is an important part of our city, right? So you have. The concept is you have these two large sort of dumbbells on each side, right? Regent Street is the bar, and then Camp Randall and the Cole Center are these two massive spaces 
that draw tens of thousands of people per year. But there's no real connection. There's no actual bar in that dumbbell to connect these two places. At the same time, you have this massive, massive Park Street healthcare district, right? With uh, SS, uh, SSM St. Mary's, Meritor Hospital, uh, the different clinics that are there. A lot is happening right there. But yet somehow these, all of these important economic entities are not connected. And when you also add in that the Regent Street is the gateway to the main commercial corridor on Monroe Street, it really is an important section that we haven't seen maybe develop the way we wanted. And the Regent Street plan wanted to create more development and did a very good job of saying how many floors we should have in this section, what kind of amenities we want to have. But the plan never happened. And it is hyper important that it does because you have these two amazing facilities plus the healthcare district, plus Monroe Street, all connected by Regent Street. So when you started looking at what are the potential opportunities for this area, you start to see they're everywhere. And the group identified uh, 12, 12 or 13, 12 main amenities uh, and analysis and opportunities that we can be analyzed to say, look, this is what could happen in these spaces along Regent Street. First, and we're gonna go over each of these a little bit more in depth, but I, it's a good map to sort of show what the group was thinking through Vanderwall, is that you really can, in the first area, transform that intersection of Regent Street and Monroe. It's a funky intersection, right? You've got two main streets coming in. You've got a little slip street called Little Street, literally. You've got a, a side street off a of breeze terrace that comes on. It's an, it, it's an interesting intersection, right? So could we transform really the gateway, to, one of the gateways to the west side of the city into a, sign, uh, a signature community and, and a destination for UW, right? This sort of piazza idea where you sort of bring everything together. Can you then, with by doing that, expand access, particularly pedestrian access to the retail experience, a very still very strong retail and restaurant experience on Monroe Street, which has flourished for years, even, even under COVID. Now, at the same time, just to the north of the stadium, there are potential ways to create a rail excursion for game days. Because if you know Union South, when it was built, if you look on the, the, the side uh, closest to Johnson Street, it looks sort of unfinished. And that's because potentially you could add in uh, some sort of rail facilities at that location because the rail line is right there. So could you create a rail system uh, for game days that maybe started in, say, Middleton and then drove to the game and you could go back the other way. Uh, Iowa has done this and many other universities have done this. So is this a potential to show up, hey, there really could be rail transit. The fourth, and I think really important to me and some other people like Susan who bike all of the time, is what can happen with the bike path itself, right? It's a very nice, the Southwest Trail, it's a great trail that runs right through the heart of downtown, right next to Regent Street. But there's not a lot of amenities on it. Some have come recently with the uh, Hilton Garden Inn Hotel, which we'll discuss later. But could you really create a more signature bike path and amenities on that? There's a decent amount of green space in that section. There's a lot of interaction with the huge populations in the student body. Uh, a lot of great important cross streets like mills that go through it. Uh, and so could we do more with the uh, bike path and really enhance it? Speaking of bikes, there is a large amount of bike infrastructure already on the street, right? With budget bikes and these different bike stores that Roger Charlie owns. And potentially you could cluster those together and really create this bike economy on Regent Street. The other thing is you really want to try to extend park, uh, the park's presence to Regent Street. There's a little, little park right off of the uh, court streets just to the south of uh, Regent Street that really people don't even know is there. Uh, and how do you make sure that park has a presence onto Regent Street and brings people in? It's this great city park, a full block right there. It's fantastic. Seventh, how do we look at infill development and really make sure we have the development we need in that area? Uh, admittedly, it's a bit of a disparately developed area. You've got some places with parking lots directly in front of buildings, which we don't see anymore in the downtown core. You have maybe underused sites. The height isn't there. How do we really take that middle section, um, basically almost to Camp Randall through to about Mills, and really amplify it into something more 
where you can develop it. We can have mixed use. You could have some office. You could have some retail. You could have some restaurants. And it really connects better to the street. Now, one of the big ideas, and again, these are all ideas. Lord only knows that they're going to happen. But one of the ideas is, do you, how do you create a bigger game day experience uh, primarily for the football games and the, and the volleyball games, which is a, as someone that used to manage Hotel Red is a huge economic driver. You, how do you really make that more of an experience in the area? Uh, and one idea is, could you potentially close down part or all of Regent Street during game days uh, or other events like Festa Italia, which was you know, something that happened for a long time in the city? Could we really look at the public space different? I would argue this conversation has been completely accelerated at, since COVID, uh, because we now look at public space different. So is there the possibility to do this? Maybe close down one lane each, but create a better connection in a much more festive and I think better controlled game day atmosphere. As someone that has worked a lot of game days in my life, I think it would be great to have this sort of uh, uh, unique experience as Badgerville, along with what the Badgers are doing in their, uh, around their, uh, their campus. And so this is really an opportunity, I think, to, to think big about what can happen. Nine, you know, obviously there's a huge Italian heritage in the site uh, in Greenbush and all of these amazing places that, 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 that are there and were there. But at the intersection of Park and Regent where Greenbush is, where Forboni's was, um, is their ability to sort of recreate that feel. And there's several uh, developers that are looking at those sorts of things, several projects that might happen. Uh, 10, explore major use, uh, major mixed use development in the parking lots that are right on um, Regent Street. So Davis Duradine and the uh, Surgery Center and all these different places that are right there. Is there better use? Uh, to build drillings and the team's credits who are right now, there, there really is allowing for a lot of height. You know, it's anywhere from six to, I think, up to 12 floors or 10 floors um, that are, can happen in that area. And really, we can animate that more by more mixed use development at that intersection. 11, certainly have to enhance the uh, corridor streetscape there, right? It's very much road driven off of that intersection. And how do you make those connections uh, better to that healthcare district, um, which are, is so important to the city? Um, and then last but not least is trying to figure out making the coal center more of a destination. And how do we connect the coal center to Regent Street? Uh, right now it is cut off. Uh, there is the path um, on East Campus Mall uh, or what was one time known as Murray Mall. So you do have the campus, uh, the path under there, but there isn't a strong connection. And potentially could we do something over the top, right? To connect Francis Street to Regent Street. Francis Street is the side street that runs next to Coal Center. And how do you make better connections between those two streets? So just to take a closer look at each one of these areas. So as we talked about sort of that barbell idea, this is one of the main areas. Could you create a piazza and when, in this, this area for game day experiences, for volleyball, for just for life, right? With the intersection of the bike pass, Regent Street, Monroe Street, Little Street, Breeze Terrace. Uh, this is an older map when we were doing the work and you can see some things have already changed. So this project is happening organically because people are partially, but also because people are talking about it. And in this area alone, we've seen significant development. We've seen uh, the closing on this map of Crazy Legs Lane and then the creation of Crazy Legs Park, which has been a fantastic amenity with some outdoor seating, the beautiful badger that's there. Uh, it's just, an, it's a really nice site. UW, uh, which we'll get into in a second, has, has really added a ton of new infrastructure um, next to the uh, coal, uh, excuse me, next to the field house. Uh, and you see other projects potentially happen there, but could you do more to create a sort of this, the public and the private entities all working together to create this sort of piazza for the intersection of Regent and Monroe? So here's a, again, this is, uh, as you see at the top, confidential. Uh, this is a rendering of what could happen, right? And you've already started to see some of it happen in that triangle. That has happened. And you've seen the, the area next to the field house already happened. But eventually, what could happen with Steve Brown Apartments? What could happen with the rest of UW's land? What's, as you all read in the newspaper with my old workplace, um, Camp Randall, or I didn't work Camp Randall, Hotel Red. 
Almost, Kate Randall. Almost, hey, Jason, almost. let yes. me just chime in for a second. There's yeah. a lot of amazing comments in the chat right now. Um, and I don't want, I, I think, um, keep them going, guys. But um, also, let's listen to what Jason has to say to wrap this up. And then we can have those conversations. I just don't want you to be distracted by, like, there's, keep them coming. We'll, we'll review them as soon as you're done. But I did see that they were all coming in, but no offense. They're coming in. They're great. I, I wasn't I paying attention, attention to them. I was just sort of rolling down the hill. But I'm I think glad. we're going to be. We're going to be able to talk about, I know there's a TID district that's in there. Uh, we've yeah. got that later coming and I'm going to go over that district as well. But we so got only a few more minutes on this presentation. And I love the discussion. Like this is the whole point is to have this exactly. discussion. So this is again a rendering of what could happen uh, uh, in this uh, area at Regenton Park. Um, again, kind of a drawing of what's happening today and what potentially could happen. Working through and, you know, reconfiguring the bike path that still is a prominent part of it, but buildings, you know, potentially could go up there. Another sort of schematic of potentially, again, what could happen. This is a draft of what could happen with the Sea Brown apartments, with Hotel Red, with the public right of way. Um, a lot could potentially happen. Uh, you, you actually, it's the new development on the far lower left hand corner ha has happened. Greg Chemansky has built a four story building, and our own wonderful Ann New Year Morrison uh, added a building just a block and a half up at 1722 Monroe Street. Fantastic for the street with Grando, Gars, and the, the Monroe Street uh, Art Center, really amazing. Sort of all of this work happening just outside of that area. It's really exciting. So kudos to, to Anne, kudos to Greg Shemansky, kudos to the city, hugely for uh, reworking Crazy Lakes Plaza and Crazy Lakes Triangle uh, there as well, and to the university too. All right. So the other area, the other end of that barbell is the Coal Center and all of the Alexander project uh, plan that is located right there. Uh, obviously, you know, we've already seen some of this land work and we're going to go over, uh, change over and we're going to go over what that looks like here soon. Uh, but this is what could happen, right? Instead of having those surface parking lots, could you build more housing, more towers? One of these has already been built. The one on the uh, upper left-hand side, which is a new Hilton Garden Inn Hotel. I think it's a about 200 room hotel, uh, tucked away beautifully right on the bike path. Uh, next to, to Murray Mall or it's East Campus Mall. Uh, and there are potential plans uh, in the works for other projects in this area as well. But I think the key thing is how do you connect those projects across the railroad tracks and across the Southwest Trail to the rest of Regent Street. So here you see on that sort of middle of the drawing, um, and potentially, you know, some sort of pedestrian bridge or something that could create over that facility. So you have better connections to Francis Street, which is again, the street uh, to the right of the Coal Center and then into Regent Street as well. There are other ideas, as we mentioned before, creating an Italian Heritage Center. You've got the Italian Workmen's Club. You could do classes there. You've got the UW Center for Italian and Italian American Studies. Could they potentially go here? Fabonis, oh, rest in peace. I tried to eat as many uh, hot Italian beef sandwiches as I could to keep them open, but it didn't work. Uh, uh, but you've got all of the different projects and there's potentially new Italian restaurant coming in. There's a lot of things happening in this area, right? Could this be the Little Italy of Madison. Could we create a bike cluster? You've got all the bike stores. You've got the amazing Southwest Trail right there. You've got the bike path. You know, you, you could be cycles. You've got everything right there. Is there a way to create a bike cluster in this part of the city? So these are just some, some fun ideas of what's happening. The, the last section here is this, you know, healthcare um, cluster and gateway. We've got, we're so lucky to have both of the hospitals, the clinics, the surgery center, all located that close to downtown. But could we use this land for more? And this gives a drawing basically of redoing those parking lots within the Regent Street plan. So this is not adding any more height. This is what you could build by the plan. And so really animating and looking at that space uh, moving forward. So it could potentially be a huge economic um, driver for the area for the residents, for the workforce, it could be just a fantastic project here as well. But again, this is all, you know, this is all an opportunity analysis. So some, some things have come to fruition in the last five years since this came out, and we are still waiting on other projects, and some may not happen. Something may happen different. But, but again, this sort of brings us back to all of the different potential opportunities we have on Regent Street. So it really is an exciting time uh, for this. Now, Couple of things have happened I wanna just bring up before uh, we get into the discussion. We have um, first the TID, which I think was brought up in the chat. So there is a new TID, I'm going to share my screen again uh, for the TID. Maybe I'm not going to, one second here, oh, sorry.
there it is. Um, so uh, about a month ago or six weeks ago or so, a new TID was created for this area and it's TID 48. So you can see here from this map where the TID is. So the TID extends uh, to the north all the way to Bassett. So into the fourth district and Alder Revere's district. And it snakes along down uh, West Washington Avenue, takes a big chunk, including the aforementioned area where Bayview is doing their work and the CDA, and the Community Development Authority is doing their work um, right here off of uh, Braxton. Uh, and then also goes all the way down Regent Street and then ends up right around Hotel Red and grabs the area through there. So TIT 48 was created. Um, some of the goals, excuse me, sorry for making you seasick, uh, but here are where they're hoping to make those public improvements. So about $500,000 spent on East Campus Mall, $100,000 on a West Main Bike Boulevard, uh, on Regent itself, the street itself, about 6.5 million, on Park itself, 3.3 million, and on, on West Washington, 3.7 uh, million. Uh, so this is what's what's happening right now um, with this. We we think there's this is a, an area for we can have real growth and a real driver. We're hoping that a lot of this money goes into economic development projects can happen aside from 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 the public improvements, which are great, but also you know what can happen with the project as well. So TID 48 has started. Uh, it was certainly there to help with the CDA work primarily, uh, but we hope that this tool can be used um, in larger uh, projects as well. All right, so we've got a quick update on what's happening on the street itself. There is a lot of projects. We had our first Regent Street revitalization meeting in quite a while since COVID in uh, last week, and we heard some updates from several different um, several different areas uh, that are doing diff significant work. UW in particular has a ton of projects happening in or near Regent Street with the new comp computer data information sciences building. Um, right next to the Discovery Institute and Engineering, actually looking at how they're looking at housing in and near Regent Street, all part of their plan, all public, but all happening as we speak right now. UW Athletics with the aforementioned work on the plaza. If you haven't seen it, it's amazing. And then the work on the field house, just gorgeous what they did with opening up the glass, the light that comes through, it's fantastic. And as you all know, they are making some changes to the south end zone of uh, Camp Randall starting immediately after the fifth quarter uh, starts from what I understand uh, next year to get it done before the 2022 season, adding some suites and integrating it more with the field house. It's really, really important work. So this is will help build what we look like is a piazza in the area. Also the aforementioned Hilton Garden Inn was created uh, right off of the Cole Center. Um, the work is happening, I think importantly at the depot with Roger Charlie with the opening of Harvey House and Bandit and there are better connections to sort of to Regent Street, the new development that is right next to um, the depot, which is the old uh, Kelly's Market is a fantastic apartment building that's gone up with a great uh, tenancy of Sprinkman, uh, uh, Red Card Media and uh, Laura and the team. Laura Gallagher at the team. So it's just fantastic, fantastic site with a creative company. Uh, you also have the amazing work of Bayview who has started already. Uh, and I'll leave that one for you to all come back on the 28th to, to pay attention about what more is happening on that area. And then the CDA, um, they are about to make an announcement on a developer and that should be uh, very exciting news. So we're excited about the, the whole triangle and the work they're doing. Uh, very important work there. Some smaller things that I think are important though, um, you know, you've got some retail that's opened, right? You've got the project um, that Leopold, it's a great little bookstore on the 1300 block. And they're potentially the renovation of Rockies into an Italian deli and an Italian restaurant. So lots happening there. Uh, Rod Ripley and the team are going to begin their work on adding additional housing behind Lucky's and the, the basically the volleyball section right off the court streets there. And then you saw in the news this week, um, my old workplace, Hotel Red, uh, the plan commission allowed for change of uh, usage and they're now going to become apartments thanks to our friends at Steve Brown Apartments. That should be fantastic. And they are actively looking at what they could do with their Regent Street property, which I think is a pretty key to this whole conversation. And they're, they're actively looking at that now and how they could potentially move that project forward with several, ever par <clears throat> several more partners. Excuse me. So to sum up, there's a lot happening. There's a lot of uh, potential opportunity and a lot of ways to move forward. Um, DMI right now is helping with the Regent Street Revitalization Group with their admin um, just to keep the group going. Uh, but Pam, several of us, we're going to get together to figure out how we really move this forward. And, and again, not have a plan, sit dusty on a shelf and really make 
this part of the city something cool. So you can see how much development is happening already and how much opportunity there is. You can really see it almost as the next Cap East on the side of downtown. So there we are and certainly can engage. I know there's a lot of discussion in the chat uh, and a lot of discussion overall. So certainly can take questions. Uh, Pam, is there anything I missed? Pam is an expert in this. So anything I missed, my friend? No, I think you did a great job covering a lot of material, Jason. Um, I, the one, th I, maybe just, uh, I know you mentioned the UW quite a bit, but they really were a big player and a driver for a lot of this, recognizing that game day is going to look different in the future. How do you continue to bring people into the games? And how do you, what, how can we have more than just you know, vertical drinking up and down the street was, you know, making it like Green Bay, if you've been up there in the um, Rush Center and how that area is now kind of a destination, even if you don't have a ticket to go into the Packer game, it's a cool place that you want to come and hang out and there's bands and activities and you can bring your kids and not have them, you know, learn some new words or you know, see some things that you may not want your kids to see. So the UW has really been um, a big player and driver for, for this. And I saw there was a question on parking. And in our meeting last week, Gary Brown did talk about that uh, they may be looking at some structured parking and adding that kind of in the, uh, close to the McDonald's in that area, because um, that's 100% accurate. We do need to address parking uh, in this, just like we do for any other downtown projects. So nice job on everything, Jason. Yeah, that's correct. So the, the question we had about parking, yes, there is potential structured parking, and I think it could be in and around the McDonald's site, if I remember correctly, but I think they're sort of investigating where that could be, because that is uh, pretty important. Uh, and I, I think a note to, to Julie and a few others about the hospitals, uh, yes, we want to make sure they are part of the conversation as well, because they are actively looking at what they can do with that space. This is their key, really key to the conversation. Uh, Jason, let yeah. me just ask, I mean, is Kevin yeah. Schnitzler from Meritor involved at all or anyone so, from Meritor or UW Health at the table? Uh, yes, but Kevin, is Kevin still, because his email, this is totally admin part of the job. I'm not 100% sure. I know where you're going with that. I can I don't, find out. He, his email kept getting bounced back to me. So if you have a good contact there, please send it our way. We, we absolutely want to make sure some, Kevin or somebody is there. But well, he kept, I, will kept talk to them. I, I will talk to them. I mean, I represent them um, for local government and on the DMI board. So um, I will connect with them on that. But, you know, UW Health also is, we operate at 20 South Park and one South Park. So we are on the corner. Um, so I think it's important that both of us are engaged in this. And so I'll follow up with that offline with you. Thank you. Julie, this is exactly why we have these meetings is to get make sure we're getting everyone there. And that's why I came. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jason, I just want to clarify is because I, I this is my understanding of it. Maybe you can echo that you can chime in. But the plan that exists was a plan that involved a lot of the stakeholders, including those. Uh, that Julie mentioned, so they were involved in it, but now it's kind of what what happens with the plan? How does it become action? So there's not necessarily an effort to replan this area. Is that correct? This is just, you know, we have this plan. What did we do with it? What can happen now? Completely correct. And, and Kevin was a huge part of that original plan uh, that was done in 2008. Um, and UW Health was also part of that plan. But as we sort of get into the implementation phase and how we can move it forward, we absolutely have to have everyone at the table. We want to make Yeah, it and I mean, a lot has changed in our real estate planning and portfolio yeah. and is changing right now under our feet, as you might imagine. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a great time to have this conversation. Um, you know, and then I, I just also want to mention that we participated in the Triangle Bayview plan that is also an important part of this because it really addressed a lot of the, um, especially PED improvements that are needed on that end of the Regent Street corridor. You know, it's it's so dangerous. And I'm, I'm just looking in the chat and I'll say um, for the Bayview plan, residents were driving it and, and super included. Um, all the people who live in the Triangle and in the Monona Bay neighborhood. So, um, you know, and that's that's new, obviously, since 2008. That's pretty hot off the presses. So that's another um, really important dimension of work that can contribute to this overall package. And I think that I think a lot of that is included in that those two dollars. 
Yeah, absolutely, Julian. I, I want to amplify your point. And actually, a question that I think Angela had as well: Were the residents involved? Absolutely, they've been involved from the get-go, and um, they're still involved in both the planning creative in 2008, but in this group as well. If it's Greenbush, if it's Bayview, if it's Canna, which is we've been super excited for the creation of, of Canna, which is a campus area neighborhood association, uh, sort of handling the, the the northern side of the street. Uh, I think we had and what five, 10 residents that were part of the last call, it was a significant amount. And we, we absolutely have to make sure that that continues to, to happen. Um, yeah. Regent Street is such a long street with, as Jason mentioned, so many different constituencies. And, uh, you know, it's quite a challenge, I think, to plan a street like that for the planners who worked on this to, um, you know, to make sure it's focused everywhere on all the different districts um, and make it still like a unified street that works. So kudos to kind of recognizing these nodes and trying to integrate them. Uh, but again, if anyone has anyone else that needs wants to, should be a part of this, let, let us know. It looks like Bill, you have a question? Yeah, I got a, a comment. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, in, we, we looked at the, that project plan for, for the TID and, you know, wonderful large projects plan for revitalizing the streetscape and the public infrastructure. But in order for that TID to work, it needs to be, a, those public investments need to be a catalyst for private investment. Um, that is taxable. So for that TID to work, you, you, you mentioned, Jason, like being like Cap East. It's going to need to be like Cap East to work financially. You know, it, the, 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 the investments of the CDA and, and the, you know, Bayview aren't taxable. UW is not taxable. UW Health not taxable. It's got to be major investments in private taxable property up and down Regent Street for that TIF district to work financially. Yeah, certainly point well taken, Bill. Um, you're absolutely right. And I think the mix of pub, uh, public versus private property is, is, is important in this area. There is a lot of public uh, non-taxable land on Regent Street. Uh, more questions, thoughts? Am I moderating my own presentation? Is that? Yeah, is but that, you're doing great. Not, you're, is that not, that's not a good idea. I think there should No, be. that's fine. Um, that's awesome. <laughs> Sorry if I have. A couple of the things that we didn't touch on that came up in the chat and I don't want to call anyone out, but Susan, did you want to mention anything else about um, transportation in this corridor? Because you had a couple of comments about the RTA and about how transportation has worked or could work around here. Susan uh, uh, Oh, uh, <laughs> thanks, man. Not really, except that um, listening and paying attention to the um, to the ideas and the maps, et cetera, I, my brain does go to the transportation thing. Um, and, but I don't have anything in particular, but I think that's going to be a really big deal, especially, um, um, pedestrian type transportation. You got all, you got people coming, you're going to have people coming from all different directions. But anyway, there's already been a lot done, um, and well, a medium amount done up near the up near the stadium, which was a good thing. So it has already started, and we already have a nice, a really good pad bike, um, uh, uh, um, what do I want to say, stretch that goes that has been really good for um, for that district. But I don't know; it's going to be interesting. But that's going to be a huge part because I noticed also people talking about parking because. People are still going to come in cars, you know. So how are you going to how are you going to deal with that? But how can you actually encourage people to maybe not always come by car? So, well, I think Susan, to your point, I think we've also seen greater infrastructure off of that main Southwest Trail. They've done a much better job of making bike lanes and things oh, in yeah. use on Orchard or, or or Mills or whatever it is. It's, right. It's really, the connections are much stronger. Yeah, this city is highly has, important. Uh, the city has done a nice job. And yes, there's there's a platform at Union South for light rail. Because <laughs> we were over optimistic. Oh, well. You drive by it now. Every time it's probably going to notice. You drive by it and think, oh, that's what that is. Yeah, I even remember being with Dick Wagner when I was on the RTA board. And and there was a light rail that had, uh, it, it was in town and it had come into town. And it, it showed what it would be like. Um, we got on it and we rode it to the stadium. It's kind of cool. 
Anyway, we'll see. Now we have BRT, so maybe BRT can be part of this. I don't know. The game day excursion com commuter rail was so close to becoming a reality. I mean, we were sitting in the athletic department, looking down at the field, having discussions on how to promote that to season ticket holders, because that would solve a big UW parking problem. And it was right. really, really close. Uh, and uh, then COVID happened. So hopefully we can get yep. that momentum back. Yeah, hopefully. Because other cities have done a really good job with um, sports facilities in their downtown in a denser area. And they've done such a good job with um, getting people to the game, not by a single vehicle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, Pam, to speak to that more, you were, I think it was UW, or I'm sorry, uh, University of Iowa that was really very strong on this. And speaking of sports facilities, I'm sorry to be a homer. Um, but, you know, check out Target Field in Minnesota. I mean, they literally have a transit center built into it, light rail, hard rail, bike facilities, everything literally built into the stadium. Uh, and, and it's the smallest footprint of any major league stadium, uh, obviously baseball, but, uh, football, which are the larger of the two, but by far the smallest footprint. It is important because what are you going to use all of this valuable land just for parking? I don't think so. And look, as a fan of the Minnesota Twins, we might as well win in something so we'll win in transportation because we're not winning on the field <laughs> anyway thanks anyone else a vikings fan here welcome to misery <laughs> uh question about whether or not brt will connect to the area good question as of right now it would not but we would try to figure out the connections off of the um johnson university avenue uh connect <laughs> Oh. Ann and I are answering the same question, uh, but yes, yeah, as right. of right now, yeah, we have to figure out what those connections are off of bus rapid yeah. transit, right? Um, and off of that corridor, because we know that a, a, a huge chunk is going to run through the university, right? 50% of all or more ridership on Metro Transit is university-based, students, mm -hmm. faculty, staff, what, what, whoever it is. Uh, and how do we make those connections between that couplet, which is just to the north, right? The the, the, the Johnson University Avenue couplet, and how do we get people back into that neighborhood uh, quickly? That, that um, one of the great things Susan always taught me is that first mile, last mile issue, right? How do we move people the first mile, last mile into right. that area? Because we're going to see more density in that area. And I think the plan, the Regent Street plan, rightfully says there should be more density in that area. It's a, it's a place where we can create a node. We've got to create transportation infrastructure around that node to get to downtown, to get to Hilldale, to get to the east side, north side, wherever you're going. Feel free to use the chat or to raise your hand literally or your little hand button, everybody. This is a really informal discussion. As you can see, a lot of folks have been involved in this over um, time and are ping-ponging back and forth. And I see Angela Jones has her hand up. Jason, Angela, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering, because I'm a you know big fan of lots of um, green space. And so I really worry about us over developing and not having green space. When I grew up, you know, green space in my neighborhood was, you know, something that I'd spend a lot of time playing in. And I just don't see that opportunity for kids that much, particularly when yeah. you're coming into that downtown um, area. So I do worry about kids not having those same types of experience and, and opportunities. Is there, will there be lots of green space and opportunities? And I understand that, you know, people don't like parking lots, but um, I don't want to go drive to a ramp and then have to walk six miles or six miles or six blocks to where I'm trying to get to come into downtown. There's plenty of other things to um, around the community. So if there's not adequate parking, I'm not driving into downtown, irregardless of what you have down there, um, because there's other opportunities. So I think you need to keep that in mind, too. I know, you know, um, you want to develop more down there too, but there needs to be adequate parking and not just ramp parking that people have to search and find where that is. Yeah, Angela, these are both really great, really great points. I think on the, on the latter point, on the second point on the transportation, absolutely. We need to, to have the transportation demand management to make sure we understand who's coming down there to have access to parking, uh, all of the different modes that are coming down to make sure we have those um, connections because you're right if people don't feel like it's easy to come down to that area or however they get there they, they won't come the park the park space I think is, is vitally important look if we, if we learned a lesson from COVID we need to look at how we use our public space right and we need to have more green space and more open space there is a sneaky amount of good space around there so I think the first thing we do is we have to 
accentuate that we have that, right? There's a park right off of Regent Street that I, I bet people didn't even know was there. A whole city block, beautiful park. There's a ton of greenway off of the Southwest Trail. There's also, I think importantly, Angela, a plan for Mifland. So Mifland neighborhood is just uh, above where the train depot is, so right off of Regent Street, to build the plan. The city has had uh, millions, uh, thanks, Ed Cleave Park, thank you, is the name of the park. Um, the, the city's had millions set aside from the park impact fees to build a park in the Mifland area. They've seen it as a, um, for lack of a better term, park park desert in, in, in the downtown. And so how do we connect that? Because that'll be right next to this to create that green space. But I also think you want to make sure when you're developing, you're creating the green space that needs to happen so that people have the spaces that they want where they can congregate and get together. And that's one of those cool, coolest things about that Crazy Legs Park. By taking rid of getting rid of Crazy Legs Lane, they doubled basically the size of the park and it made it much more amenable for people. We need to do more projects like that. So Angela, two, two great points. Thank you. Yeah, pocket parks like Lisa Link Peace Park. Fantastic. Yeah, great idea. Jason and others, some questions from the chat. Um, you know, uh, Jenny and um, John had kind of related questions. One is, you know, are there any other projects planned like where the 7-Eleven is? And then John's kind of more like, how do we get information on what's happening in this area? Um, you know, certainly I, I can name a couple developments. I think, John, you asked earlier about the development on the corner of Park and Regent, when I think you were asking not about the hospital bun, but the one in the church across the street. Um, Jason, I understand they're just um, still kind of working on that without any major updates. Um, other yeah, I believe they're kicking the happening. tires, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then, I, you know, I'm not aware of any um, like that 7-Eleven site, I'm not aware of a lot of activity. I don't know if others are, <clears throat> but we no. can certainly kind of make, you know, again, I think since there's not a great holder of all this information, we could have another update, you know, as a future meeting on kind of what we're seeing or we're open to ideas about how to better share information about what we know about development downtown in general. DMI uh, maintains an amazing map of all the permits and proposed projects around downtown. So you can always look at that. Yeah, I think that's what we'll use. So uh, on our, if you go to the DMI website on the economic development tab under our work, there is a development tracker. And we we go over that probably, we update it every other week or so. Gabriel, um, Terrell and our team uh, do a great job of keeping that up to date. So that's one place we will do that. I have not heard of anything happening in that 7-Eleven site or those sites. I will say there are just a ton of developers looking at different sections. So, I, you know, I, you know, I don't hear things as the town gossip. People don't tell me a lot, unfortunately, because they tell me when they want me to get information out. Uh, they don't tell me when they want me to keep it quiet. I swear I can keep a secret, though. I promise. I, I, I do promise. One question I had for, and again, I don't know who is the best person to answer this is, but my perception is that billboards and power lines have always yes. been kind of an impediment Huge. to development on Regent Street and just make it just a really uncomfortable place to be as a pedestrian. Um, but I think there is some progress on both yes. billboards and I don't think on power, but um, does anybody know yeah. about those efforts to yes. improve it? I do know about the billboard effort. So I don't know about the power lines, but the billboard effort, yes. So the city um, brokered a deal with, I can't remember who owns the billboards there. I, I don't remember who it is. Um, but they brokered a deal to move those billboards. There was a large one on top of Lucky's. There was a large one on top of uh, Big Ten Pub and a few others. And that honestly was limiting development, right? Because the air rights and all the rest. Uh, we've got great lawyers like Dan O'Callaghan that know how to figure that all out on this call. Um, that's why I'm not a lawyer anymore. I'll just pass it out to Dan. But they moved, they, they had an agreement. I believe they've either all been removed or are going to be removed and they're replaced by other locations throughout the city off the belt line, other locations. And so they had a like location with a number of cars or views going by, whatever their uh, criteria is for the importance of a billboard. And that was huge. That allows for development and actually, that actually allows for the Rod Ripley project at Lucky to move forward on the backside because if not, he would have had I think it's a four or five story tower that's been improved on the backside. It would have faced a billboard uh, and that would have been not desirable for anybody. So really, I think that's great work that the city and whoever else was involved did to do that. That's a heavy lift to get a billboard moved. I mean, heavier than anyone would expect. It thinks, yes. Yeah. Actually, uh, for all your billboard needs, see Dan O'Callaghan uh, at Carlson Black. He's a billboard lie expert. I, I just made that up, but whatever. <laughs> We have um, eight more minutes this morning, so keep these questions coming. Um, 
or we can move uh, on to other updates. Yeah, got one other update and I'm glad Bill Connors is on because I haven't told Bill Connors in this advance. So I hope he's listening right now. He, he, he lifted his head up. Uh, but both Bill and myself, I know the team from the Greater Madison Chamber have had significant conversations. This is a total, sorry, non sequitur. We're going to another subject. Uh, a, um, uh, conversations with Deputy Mayor Christy Bamel and the new Sustainability and Resiliency Coordinator of the city, Jessica Price. There's an article about her in the paper two weeks ago or so about a potential energy efficiency, efficiency programs for buildings. Uh, and they're in early conversations, but we wanted to make sure you all are aware of it. Uh, my, my, when I talked to them, I said, make sure you get people in early and often and together to have these conversations, working with the builders, the developers, the construction companies, the law firms, everyone on these issues. Bill, I know you also have met with Jessica uh, and Deputy Mayor Bamel as well. Not, not with Jessica yet. Uh, I've been talking um, uh, with, uh, with Christy about setting that meeting up. And then she came back to me and said, well, shouldn't we just like get a larger group together, not just, you know, have us just meet with Smart Growth and then meet with DMI and then meet with, and I said, yeah, absolutely. Let's get us all together. Yeah. So, but I have, that meeting hasn't happened yet. So no, I haven't not met, uh, I have not met Jessica yet. Yeah, that, that, it's a great point. So one of the ideas I had just say, let's bring us all together, right? Because it's when you, I don't want to say we siloed with the chamber and, and Smart Growth, we have great relationships with them, but different interests sometimes and bring us all together. It, it sounds like Craig has met with them both too. Craig, yeah. do you have more of an update? Yeah. Maybe Craig's not there. Sorry. No, oh, there. sorry. Um, Finding his new um, button. I was, I'm on my phone. So um, met with them. They just asked a bunch of questions about what they thought would work. Um, I just sort of advised them, you know, to try and do it more demand driven as opposed to a supply driven uh, edict about uh, efficiency. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, when you create uh, create roadblocks for landlords and they don't always react the well, you want it to be a demand driven driven where the the tenants and the users are are requesting and, and let the marketplace take care of itself and it works faster and more efficient that way. So that was the high level outline I gave them and I told them I'd be happy to join any group uh, and happy to help out DMI relative to that. Craig, thank you for, for taking that meeting. We just wanted to flag this issue. Obviously there's, not, there's nothing there there yet, uh, but there will be soon. And so Bill, Craig, myself, I know David, Kevin and uh, Zach in the chamber also we want to make sure you all are involved in this conversation. So we will keep you up to date as to how that is happening. I think this is potentially very impactful. Thank you for the update, Jason. I, yeah, I asked, I told Jason, I thought we should also mention this. I think there's a lot of work that goes on from DMI staff and DMI members behind the scenes that um, folks don't always know that that's happening. And I'm really glad that this is um, an effort that we've been asked to kind of give feedback on as DMI. And I think it's I think it's an exciting opportunity to feed into our sustainability goals for the city. Yeah, and part of our advocacy work, I wanted, I, want, I thank them too for, I mean, they reached out to us, they reached out to Bill. And I think they seem very true and they're wanting to have this conversation. So we are very appreciative of it. I think it's a good step to get the feedback in from the practitioners that are, you know, building the buildings and, and, and getting the entitlements through and all the rest. I think that's all I had for updates, Anne. That's Jason, the one other thing I would say- Oh yeah, Craig. Sorry, Jason. The one other thing I would say is I told them also to pull in the utility companies relative to what's reportable and all that. So um, that's something we can help facilitate as a, as a board. Yeah, absolutely. I believe, Pam, I'm not sure. I, I believe they've been in contact with MG&E uh, and Alliant as well, but I, I think they have. Uh, I certainly told them the same thing. So Craig, it's good to know you and I are on the same page. So. Right. That's all I had. That's all I had too. Um, there are no other comments or questions. I think we can adjourn. Thank you, Tara, for these last comments. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it and appreciate you all being here. And Jason, thanks for um, doing that report. I know we've kind of put you on the spot to make a big presentation and you have to talk all the time, but this was awesome information. So thank you I mean, all for joining. If, if you just, all you gotta do is invite me to talk for an hour and I'm in. So that's all you need. I'll talk about anything for an hour. What would you like to talk about next? Okay. <laughs> well, we're gonna talk about Bayview next week, Thursday. Perfect. So I hope to see yes. you all there. And um, thank you for coordinating that. Thank you all. Have a good Thursday. Thanks everyone. Happy Thursday, happy weekend.